For those of you I haven't met, don't know me, I'm Dr. Sharon Milgram and I direct the Office of Intramural Training and Education. And today I am really pleased uh, to be here as part of uh, the NIH OITE Summer Lecture Series. And we decided to go casual this year, even though Dr. Tabak is wearing a tie. Um, it's uh, going to be a casual summer lecture series where instead of giving a formal uh, lecture, he's going to share some insights from his life as a scientist and his life as a public servant and as a member of many different communities here at NIH and beyond. I hope that we'll get a chance to address uh, questions that um, some of you raise, and we want to encourage you to use the Q&A box, not the chat, to submit your questions. I want to um, start by um, making my own observation about Dr. Tabak. He is, uh, this isn't his first summer uh, lecture. This isn't his first time uh, getting an email from someone in OITE saying, will you come out and talk to students? We have community college students visiting, or we have uh, a summer lecture series we need, or it's postdoc appreciation day and we need someone to scoop ice cream. He has come to many, many trainee events. He is a mentor to many, not only uh, trainees in the intramural program, but NIH staff all across this campus. Uh, many times when I've needed uh, some sage guidance, I've asked him for a few moments of his time. He is a real champion for trainees and for training, and he is a remarkable uh, public servant who has stepped in as acting director of NIH on multiple occasions. So in your um, bio, it talks about, um, first of all, let me just say thank you for being here. Um, I really appreciate it and the students who are here do as well. In your bio, it says that you were a dean um, at Rochester and then you came to NIH to direct the Dental Institute and then you became the acting, uh, the acting deputy director and then principal uh, deputy and acting director at times. So we know a lot about your um, positions, but very few of the trainees know much about you. So rather than that professional uh, bio, I wonder if you could just tell us who you are a little bit. <laughs> well, first, thank you for uh, what was an overly generous introduction. I, I do appreciate it. Um, so um, I think that um, when people ask me what the smartest thing I ever did in my career was, I tell them it was my decision to be born in New York City at a time when college was free, um, because free was the only thing that I could afford. And, uh, and so I was able to uh, attend the City College of New York for my undergraduate work. And, um, and it was really, um, you know, a, a, a really life altering experience for me. Um, you know, had I not had the good fortune of being in New York at a, at a time when it was free tuition, um, I probably would have become a shoe salesman, uh, which was my, uh, one of my many part time jobs um, going through um, high school, college, and dental school. Um, and that would have been fine too, I guess, but, uh, but, but uh, because I had the good fortune of a, of a free public education, um, it opened up many opportunities that otherwise, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have occurred. So, so I'm really, you know, a product of, of that environment. Um, and um, although I've, I now have lived in Maryland longer than any other place, um, at least in one spot. Um, you know, I'm, I, I guess you can't, you know, you can take the kid out of New York, but you can't take the New Yorker out of the kid. So I think I'm still pretty much a New Yorker at heart. And do you uh, at least root for Maryland sports teams or still New York sports teams? Um, so I'm an unabashed fan of the New York Yankees. 
<laughs> uh, much to the dismay of my friends who uh, are uh, rooters for the Nationals and the Orioles. And uh, I, I've sort of given up on pro basketball, but there was a time in my life where I followed the Knickerbockers also. So no, I'm, uh, I, I've never, uh, never changed those. Never let go. Well, uh, I, I come from Philadelphia. I've never let go of uh, our teams uh, there in Philly either. So you started at uh, City College, which could have majored in anything. So what pushed you towards uh, uh, various uh, science courses? Yeah, so I, I guess I, I had made up my mind that I, I was interested in, in biology um, in high school, um, where, I, where I encountered my first mentor, um, the, the chairman of the Department of Biology there, a guy named William Berman. And, um, <laughs> and it wasn't the typical uh, classroom teacher interaction that we had. Um, it, was, it was an unusual one. Um, there was a science club to prepare students in high school to compete with in the, what was then called the Westinghouse Science Competition. I think today Intel took it over and maybe somebody else has taken it over since Intel, but but anyway, it was it was that sort of national kind of competition, and 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 Mr. Berman asked me pretty pointedly why I was not attending the special class uh, to prepare students, and I and I explained that I had a, a job which I needed to keep, and and that's why I wasn't available for the special class, and so on the spot he offered me the opportunity to to be the lab prep person for the whole biology program um in those days they actually did dissections of uh, earthworms and crayfish and then frogs and that was a big deal mm -hmm. um but somebody needed to prepare all that stuff and then they and there was also some simple chemistry experiments that we would do and and so they needed somebody to prep all that stuff. Well, anyway, so I, that was my first scientific job. And, and, and at the time I did it just for the money to, to, be, to be honest, but, um, but it allowed me to back away from some of my you know, part-time jobs elsewhere and participate in that, in that um, training group. And, and, I, and I really began to fall in love with biology. And so when I attended college subsequently, um, I, I'd never given any thought to any other major other than biology. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was all about, you know, I guess there's some serendipity there, but that was, that's what led to it. Yeah. Uh, serendipity and something that we talk about a lot when we um, prepare our uh, more senior trainees to move into um uh, positions where they are leaders in industry or academia government, you know, somebody advocated for you and somebody, uh, you know, really was a mentor in a really important way, right? That teacher could have just said, oh, well, I'm sorry, you can't come. And instead, they found a way for you to come. And um, I think many times for many of the students, even here listening, there probably was a teacher just like that. Sometimes even a mentor here at NIH uh, who opened the door. And I, I would like at some point later to come back to mentorship and, and your views on how we cultivate a real culture of mentorship in science. But I want to uh, stay on track with your career. I didn't mention that you actually are a dentist. Um, and so how did you go from undergrad to dental school? So um, as a biology major with a minor in chemistry, um, I, I had, my, my goal was to go to medical school. And unfortunately I did not um, get in. Um, I, wasn't, I was turned down by all the medical schools that I applied to. Um, and so, so I, I, I graduated from college in 1972, which was the very end of the, the tor towards the end of the Vietnam War. And for reasons that I won't bore you with, I was a conscientious objector. 
um, and um, was sort of navigating that system. Mm -hmm. um, didn't get into medical school and um, went in to, to a master's program at Hunter College, which was another free university at, in the city university system and worked in a, in a biophysics lab um, and then TA'd at night to earn money. And with, with the idea that I would apply again to medical school, which I did, and parenthetically, once again, was not accepted at any of the schools. Um, but while I, was, while I was there and doing basic fundamental research, so it was delayed light emission of subchloroplast particles. Okay, that um, didn't mean a lot. <laughs> well, it, it didn't mean a lot to me either. Yeah. Uh, it, it, was, it was so esoteric that I, I decided, you know, I have to do something in research that relates to people because what I was doing was I was picking up spinach at the market, extracting the chloroplasts from the spinach all day long, then spent two hours at night doing biophysical measurements. And the only people who cared were me and my mentor and some guy that worked with him. And that was it, nobody else in the world cared. So, so the, the, the chairman of that department said, you know, why, why don't you just get a PhD and, and you know, do, and I said, well, I really want to align what I'm doing with more with people. And she said, well, then why don't you go to dental school? And I looked at her like she was out of her mind because it never in a million years occurred to me to go to dental school. And so it, honestly, on a, on, on just that comment, I applied to one dental school <laughs> and I applied late. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, didn't hear anything. And so I figured, well, okay, well, I'll add that to the pile of rejections that I had from, from, from uh, medical schools. And then I got a call in late May to appear for an interview at, at Columbia, which is a dental school. And I, and I was interviewed by the then, I, I subsequently learned was the dean of the school. I didn't know that at the time, of course. Mm -hmm. And he was a pretty imposing person physically well over six foot feet you know big big fellow and he walked in and and because he made me wait and he you know brings me into his office and he looks at me and looks at my ostensibly my folder i don't know what it really was throws the folder down on the table and says payback we're not going to accept you and so back then when i you know i was much much smarter and knew everything i stood up and i said well that's your loss and i walked out of the room now, um, alert, please, none of you ever do that at an interview. <laughs> it, it probably only works once in the history of humankind, okay? Anyway, they must have really needed to fill that slot because I, 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 I got an acceptance letter the next week. Um, and, um, and I was in heaven because it, at Columbia, medical and dental students take all the pre-clinical courses together. So in effect, I was in medical school for two and a half years um, and, um, you know, doing the sorts of things that I wanted. And it was at that point where I met the next really, really important mentor in my life, a guy named Erwin Mandel, and who, in whose laboratory I worked all throughout dental school. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just dumb luck. Yeah, before we, um, I want to talk some about your experiences doing research in dental school, but I can't help but um, notice, um, so two applications to medical school, uh, you know, that that uh, led to disappointment, followed by uh, a little bit of a difficult uh path to dental school. I'm sure you didn't feel great in that moment of, um, you know, we're not going to take you. So certainly these are not the only times in your career where you have experienced some setback and disappointment. One of the trainees, uh, Camille Kedrovsky, who I think is a summer intern, might be a post -back, I'm not certain, but she specifically asked you to talk about how you overcome uh, obstacles, how you deal with disappointments like that. So it's not easy. And, and I know so many of our postbacs 
apply and reapply. So many of our graduate students and, and postdocs do the same as they move on. It, it never goes away, that needing to do things twice, three times, resubmitting. So what's your secret to um, dealing with disappointment? Um, you know, it's disappointment is all relative. Um, and, and when I consider some of the other disappointments that, that I have faced over the years, putting, putting these disappointments into a context makes it easier to just move forward. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I, I, I think I learned pretty early on that no one else is really going to advocate for me except but me. And I wasn't going to allow other people's evaluation of me, um, you know, do me in, so to speak. Um, it, it actually just made me more um, willing to, you know, do whatever would come next with even greater resolve, I guess. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I, I, I think that, um, I, I think people around me were more disappointed at me not getting into medical school than I was. And you were. Yeah. Um, but, but I, but, you know, I, I've always, I've always gone into things with more than one plan. And it's okay to do plan B or C. Um, and then you don't look back. You just, you know, you just keep going forward. Um, I, you know, and, and again, without, you know, boring people with, you know, my personal life and all that sort of stuff. You know, when my father left us, you know, and, and really had nothing to do with do with us as a family that was a disappointment <laughs> you know so relatively speaking you know you didn't get into medical school okay you know so and 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 so i i think i i think that um yeah i mean you i i just i just was unwilling to let other people tell me that i couldn't do something and, and people have been telling me I can't do things my whole life, you know, I, so, I, so I have a form of, I mean, now I know, you know, many, many years later, I have a form of dyslexia. And, and so when I was in, you know, in grade school, people questioned whether I'd get through high school. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and I have a terrible, terrible um, ability to learn foreign languages. I am a I'm a disaster uh, and, and received the lowest possible passing grade all through high school in Spanish. Um, and, uh, and, and that, that teacher, the, the chairman of the department was convinced that I should go to trade school because I would never, ever, you know, amount to anything. They, I don't think they talked very much with one another because I was, I was doing pretty well in my other coursework. So, um, yeah, so I, I've just, I've just learned to, to take those kinds of decisions and kind of package them up, stick them somewhere in my brain and use it as fuel to go forward. And move forward. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What do you, um, as you were in dental school, you started to do research. Was there um, a time when you wanted to do dentistry, like treat patients, and then suddenly you decided no, or no, it was, it was start... the reverse. Yeah, no, it was the reverse. I, I went to dental school because I wanted to do research that was meaningful to people. Yeah. And as a result, I was immediately a marked person in the dental school because I was the only such person um, like that. Everybody else was there to become a dentist. And so the faculty, which was 95% volunteer. Back then, dental schools, you know, made use of community practitioners who came in and helped. Um, 
they were convinced that I was wasting a space mm -hmm. for people who wanted to be a real dentist. And so I was, I was kind of tortured um, throughout dental school. Um, and because uh, <laughs> I didn't want to be a real dentist. Now, so, yeah. I, so by, by the time I, I graduated, they, they didn't know whether to throw me out without a degree, tenure me, because I had published, I think, like seven or eight papers while I was a dental student, um, or just graduate me to get rid of me. And, and they chose the middle, you know, the last course, just here, get, get lost. And when I, finally, when I did leave, finally, my, my mentor, Erwin Mandel, said, you know, Larry, I now have two extra hours every day. And I said, Erwin, what are you talking about? Two extra hours? Said, well, I used to spend one hour every day talking you out of quitting. And I used to spend one hour every day talking them out of throwing you out. And <laughs> wasn't an easy time, huh? It was a true story, you know. Yeah. But but in the lab, in the lab was that that's where I felt I was alive. And that's where I felt I was where I should be. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, I was just really, really lucky to, you know, to have, to have that type of opportunity. So tell us a little bit about your lab now, or, you know, sort of the evolution. I know you've been a glycobiologist for a long time, well, so you can start that story wherever yeah, you want. I mean, tell it's, us a little bit about your science. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really an interesting story. At least I think it's interesting. I, I don't know if anybody else does, but so I, as a as a second year student in dental school, I presented my first paper at a national meeting, and the paper was about the characterization of a protein in, in human saliva, which at the time it didn't have a name. If you fast forward to today, we know it was cystatin, which is a protease inhibitor found in human secretions. But at the time, we didn't know its name, and so we described it as how it behaved in a in a in a in a gel electrophoresis system it, it migrated the furthest mm -hmm. to, the, to the positive pole of an electrophoresis system not sds a native a native gel i, I guess people would call these things yeah. and so the title of the talk was most anionic protein in human saliva and i gave my talk my my 15 minute talk and wearing my only suit um and was just you know so so excited but nervous and this giant of a guy gets up who i suddenly learned was a fellow named gunnar roloff from norway in a very very deep voice who said that's not the most anionic protein in, in human saliva the most anionic protein is stuck at the top of your gel it's too big it can't get in and I was devastated. I thought my career was over. You know, it's like, oh, one paper and I'm done. You know, I'm wrong. And anyway, he he was so, he was so nice that he took me to a coffee after the session ended, and he started telling me about high molecular weight glycoproteins known as mucins, mm -hmm. which is what he worked on in in his laboratory. And he was at that time he was already a pretty senior fellow, um, and so I became really interested in what these mucins were all about. And I saw in the chat box, somebody wanted to know what I did at, uh, at, at, at in Buffalo. So I, I specifically went to Buffalo because they, they were one of two places in the country that had a PhD program that was unique for people who already had a dental degree. Mm -hmm. So, and it was either go to Buffalo or go to Seattle. And my wife who had never been outside of New York city said buffalo is still at least in new york so we're going to buffalo we're not going and that was of course the winter of the blizzard the great blizzard and so she i think may have regretted that choice but anyway <laughs> off to buffalo we went and it was there that i worked with a guy named mike levine who was a new assistant professor newly minted who had just come from a postdoc at harvard with a, guy, with a guy named Robert Spiro, who was one of the giants in glycobiology. I mean, one of the true great people in the field. And, and so I did my PhD characterizing mucin um, in, in the saliva from uh, macaques, 
um, monkeys. Um, and, and then subsequently did work in, in human saliva as well. So, so, but it all began because of that first presentation that I did as a dental student. Wow. And, and we, just, we just kept at it all these years. I mean, we, we sort of moved from characterizing the, the molecule and spending more time figuring out how it was synthesized and how it was assembled. And, uh, and so to this day, uh, my lab, studies the enzymes that put together um, this class of macromolecule, you know, the enzymes that decorate the protein backbone with sugars and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when I started, it was, it was basically two labs doing this type of work. And now every week there are scores of paper published in this field. So it's really wonderful. Oh, and one of your goals at the outset was to do something relevant to human health. And of course, mucins are important for reproductive health and the health of our respiratory system. I mean, pretty much. Alimentary uh, canal, yeah, digestive system. I mean, yeah, no, it, yeah. it's pretty, uh, pretty mainstream. And, and I really, you know, and again, it was, you know, I, and I and I and I was and I sort of I guess I gravitated to it. There was a little piece that I guess I missed out on telling you about when I was in dental school. So the dental school had no equipment at all to do research. There was a spectrophotometer. That was the only piece of equipment we had. But but my mentor, Irv, Irv Mandel, who was also by the way a City College graduate, mm -hmm. went to City College with a fellow named Elvin Cabot. Now that name probably doesn't mean anything to anybody. But he was a giant in, in the field of immunology. Um, he and Winifred Watkins in, in, in the UK figured out blood group substance, the structure of what makes you type A, type B, type O, and so forth. He had an entire floor of a research building at Columbia. He had millions and millions of dollars. Worth of anyway, Erwin and, and Elvin Cabot were classmates, and Erwin asked Elvin if I could have a key to his lab so I could use his equipment. And so as a dental student, I had the run of the best equipped lab oh, in, the, wow. in the entire university. And I, and again, it was just sort of dumb luck. I was working one Saturday morning in his lab and I, no one on this call probably even know this, but before they were pipette men, there were glass drawn pipettes called Lang-Levy pipettes. And because they were hand-drawn, each one was different. And so the first thing you needed to do when you took a set of these things was you had to calibrate them because you know you needed to know if you were really delivering 10 microliters or 100 microliters and so forth. And so I'm, you know, I was doing my work and I get this tap on my shoulder and I look up and it's, and it's the man, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. Dr. Cabot and I'm like, I was like, oh boy, what does he want? And he just, and he basically said to me, hey, did you calibrate those pipettes? And I took a sigh of relief and I said, well, yes, I did. And he said, let me see your calibration curves. And so I flipped to the front of the notebook and they were my calibration curves. And he looks at me and he looks at the calibration curves and he goes, Erwin was right. You're going to be okay. <laughs> and those were the last words he ever said to me. <laughs> but wow. you know, I had the run of his lab, you know, for, for three and a half years. So, so I was really lucky. So when I went to, by the time I went to graduate school, I had already worked on instrumentation far more advanced than any. So, so when we finally, when the school finally bought a GC, and then subsequently a GC mass spec, I was the one who showed them how to use it because I had already worked on all that stuff. It was just, you know, just really fortunate. Yeah, you know, right that's some amazing opportunity yeah, in, in yeah, both yeah. undergraduate and, and in dental school that prepared you. You know, when I hear you talk about your research, it reminds me of, you know, when I was running a lab and just how much, as there's just so much pleasure in the in the big parts of research, also the little day-to-day -day mundane things, yet here you are um, uh, doing a lot of administration, which I think is a really important aspect of, of um, how science progresses is when people who love science say, I'll, I'll delve into these other 
uh, aspects to make science better, work more efficiently, um, more equitable, more welcoming, you know, all the things we need to be. I just wonder how you, did you imagine yourself as a, you know, such a leader? Yeah, Um, I, so, so honestly, so, so my worst critic is me. I'm my worst critic. And when I made the decision to move from a school of dentistry to a school of medicine, I did so because I, I wanted I wanted to learn new stuff. And when I was at the school of dentistry as a faculty member, and somebody said, "Could you be on my grant? Because you're the best molecular biologist at the university," I got really really scared, thinking, "My God, this is a terrible university. If you know, <laughs> I'm the best." So I, I purposely went to, to, to a school of medicine and, and where I saw some really outstanding researchers. Um, again, I don't know if the name, so by way of example, uh, a woman named Louise Chow, and I don't know if the name means anything to you, but if you think about the cover of Cell where they discovered for the first time what splicing was about, you're doing heteroduplex analysis, mm-hmm. that was Louise's picture. <laughs> that was that was oh, Louis's wow. work. So I, I was introduced to these amazing scientists and began to realize, you know, I'm like a good, I'm a really good scientist, but I'm not a great scientist. But what I could be really good at, or maybe even great at, is enabling others to do great stuff. And so I, I became a chair of a department at the University of Rochester. And, um, and found that it was something that I was able to do. Um, and I derived enormous pleasure out of other people in the department succeeding. Um, and I guess people took note of that because th- they eventually asked me to become the, you know, the research dean there, mm-hmm. where I could take pleasure about the success of many, many people across the organization. And, um, and, and I, and I was able, you know, I, I, I was able, to, I mean, I kept my own lab going um, and, and, and did enjoy it, but, but also thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to enable so many other groups. Um, and, um, and so w- when I was invited to come down here by Dr. Ruth Kirstein, whose, whose office I'm sitting in, it, I, I've been here over 12 years, but it's still Ruth's office in my mind, <laughs> you know. Uh, now, she was such a, such a giant. giant. You know, just an unbelievable part. The first, uh-huh. the first woman IC director, the first woman NIH deputy, the first woman acting director. I mean, you know, just amazing in, in so many respects. Anyway, um, when she invited me down to, to become the director of the Dental Institute, and I had a really, I mean, it was a hard decision because I, I enjoyed doing what I was doing in Rochester, but I realized I could, you know, like even get back to a wider range of things by coming down. And so um, Fred Lee wants to know a little bit, I, you know, I know every day is different, but if you could give us a sense of what the NIH director does. And also he asked that you talk a little bit about how NIH and the FDA and the CDC fit together, work together, mm. just a, a little bit of maybe a, a politics uh, one yeah. yeah, sure. So um, each day is completely different. Um, I have a certain number of standing meetings. Um, I try not to do more than two um, activities such as the one we're doing here a day. Um, I, I appeared on a panel with Elias Sirhuni and, and several other people earlier today related to a joint U.S.-India um, activity for pandemic preparedness. Um, you know, I, I, I usually start, I'm usually here, it depends on the day, but usually here by about seven. And I usually leave by seven. So, you know, um, during the, you know, during the Monday through Friday and then on Weekends, I'm usually here four or five hours each day. But um, 
but every day is completely different. Um, I'll have a certain number of meetings each week with the department. Um, and, um, you know, standing meetings within the office of the director with the other deputies and other other uh, leaders. Um, so there's there's not a single day that looks exactly like the next day. Mm -hmm. um, as to how all the so-called operating divisions fit together, um, CDC, FDA, and NIH are our sibling organizations. We are all equivalent organizations, all reporting to the, the to the to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Um, one, and it's hard to say silver lining and pandemic in the same sentence, but but if there is a silver lining to the pandemic, it is that it has brought FDA, NIH, and CDC much closer together. I think our working relationships are better than ever because it became quickly apparent that we, we had to work together in a serious way to make the progress that was necessary to, to get out vaccines, to get out antivirals, to get out tests. Um, and, and, and my hope, and I think there's already evidence of this, is that this will extend beyond just the pandemic issues. Yeah. Um, because the, the very, very high collegiality, um, uh, frankly, both in the previous and in the current administration. Yeah. So that's really, you know, and again, I, again, it's hard to say silver lining with the pandemic, but, but that is one positive thing that has emerged. Yeah. I'd like to ask something um, that I think is on a lot of our minds um, as we watch the responses to the pandemic unfold. And that is, I think that scientists have always had this feeling that we're very deeply respected by the public. But the pandemic has shown some really uh, some spaces where anti-science uh, sentiment has has flourished in some ways. And I wonder if you think there are things that we as scientists need to learn from this so that we are a part of sort of mending some of those? Yeah. No, I, thanks for raising that because it's, it's one of the things that keeps me up at night, I have to say. Um, the mistrust in science is, is, is very, very, very troubling. Um, but, you know, as scientists, it, the, the onus is on us to explain science to the lay public. The onus is on us to reach out and, 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 and share with people what we're doing and why it's important. But, you know, we live in a very, very, very different world than the world that I grew up in when I was starting my career. Because now with social media and this sort of amplification that one gets as a result of social media, yeah. um, the dynamic is very different. And so I, I think we have to be very vigilant in, in seeking out opportunities, not only to speak to other scientists, which is very important, of course, but also to speak out to, to you know, you know, neighborhood groups and 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 other you know groups that 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 you know in society, uh, houses of worship, uh, you know, just. To, to meet with people who don't think about science, but to, but to do it in a way that helps explain things, so that it's understandable and 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 valued. And and I because I also think that part of the mistrust was a misperception on the part of the public that science is infallible, and of course it's not. Science is forever in, in inquiring. Science is forever self-correcting science is forever questioning. And what some people saw play out during the early, particularly the early parts of the pandemic, where people were saying, well, it's X and other people saying it's Y, is they took that healthy scientific conversation, what we would do in lab meetings, okay? Mm -hmm. they, would, they took that as a sign of, we don't know what the hell we're talking about no one took the trouble to explain that well no we're still figuring it out and it takes time to figure it out and even once you figured it out you still have to be open for for revision you know going forward you know yeah. um i spent you know like four years well three and a half years of my life figuring out the structures of carbohydrate side chains 
from a mucin from, from monkeys. And then we got a new toy in the lab, an NMR, and a new postdoc proved me wrong in like a week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> science is a <laughs> you know, target. And that's, it, you know, and, and so, but you got to be prepared for that. You got to be willing to live with that. Well, but the public doesn't necessarily appreciate that. So we've got to do a much, much, much better job in explaining, you know, science, some of the limitations, but, but of course, some of the, the enormous strengths. Yeah. And, and I hope, and, and, I, and, and I've been talking to the Institute and Center Directors about this. I think we need some research as to how best to communicate to people in, 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 in these ways. Um, I think this is like really important going forward. I really do. And so there's, there's an element as I sit here thinking about the future of science where I worry about how we talk uh, to people outside and how we are perceived outside. There's a even bigger pressing weight when I think about how we are perceived uh, within our community, when, whether we are welcoming, why uh, gender harassment and microaggressions and racial discrimination, why these uh, issues, you know, when I was a graduate student, we were talking about these things, and here we are, I'm talking about these things with current graduate students, and I know NIH has really uh, redoubled its efforts to have honest conversations in, in these arenas, and um, I know you've played a big role, um, and I wonder if you would address a little bit your thoughts about, you know, our community and, and what we do to improve our community. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's everybody's responsibility to, to improve things of this nature. Um, you know, don't turn your head if you see something that, that is inappropriate. Um, office support to and be willing to speak up if, if you do see something that makes no sense and that's inappropriate. Um, I, don't, I don't know why, I, I mean, at some level, perhaps we're a microcosm of the rest of society, doesn't make it right, but, and, and so I'm not, but I think, you know, look, people work long hours, they, they're investing enormous amounts of their time and their energy. Um, you know, when you work long hours with people, you, 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 you become more familiar with them, you know, and, and so forth. Um, but, but it's not, and I know people use the metaphor that, you know, the laboratory is a, is a family. It's not really a family. Okay. It's, 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 it's where you do your work. Yeah. And, and it's absolutely fine to enjoy your work. And it's absolutely fine to be incredibly supportive of your co-workers. But it is your place of work. And, and I think, you know, may, maybe for some people, this metaphor of family has, has made it harder to, to, to blur the boundaries, perhaps. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but but we, we just can't keep losing so many talented people because of an unwelcoming, unprofessional in, environment. And, and sadly, you know, it is it's mostly, not exclusively, but mostly directed against women. Um, it is mostly directed against people of color. Um, it is mostly directed against individuals who are you know, members of sexual and gender minority groups. Um, and we cannot afford to lose such an important swath of, of our, our workforce. I mean, it, I mean, apart from the fact that it's amoral. Yeah. <laughs> it, Maybe that really is the place we have to start is by you know, saying. I mean, apart from the fact right. that it's amoral. Yeah from a practical standpoint, we, we can't afford to bleed such talent. I mean, so, so I think what I, what I, I, I hope what people will have the courage to do is, is to be supportive of people who are not being treated appropriately, be willing to stand up for them. And if that's not possible to reach out to somebody who can, and, yeah. you know, we have a whole series of mechanisms in place here to allow that. Um, and that's gotten better, 
but it's still not perfect. I mean, it's, you know, it's still not perfect. You know, yesterday I taught in our um, three-day uh, management course and to get into that. So that's three days that our fellows and graduate students will spend learning about management. But to get in, they had to do five prerequisites, some of which were two hours, some of which are three hours. And as I was wrapping up last night, I reflected upon the fact that when I started my lab and was a manager, I had zero hours. Yeah. Right. I mean, it was just, oh, Sharon, you love science. You're good at site directed mutagenesis. Please come and run a lab. Right. And and I was really reflecting that maybe things would change because of all of the opportunities for training and, and to, to get uh, more support in how to mentor and manage people. Um, but I do think a part of this starts by your comment about the, mor the moral part, that, that we have to really start at this first principle of what kind of person do we want to be and what kind of community do we want to be a part of. Um, I, I mean, I, I just, you know, I, I tell everybody that it's so much easier if, if you are you know, honest, open, and supportive of, of your coworkers, it just makes it so much easier, you know? So much. It, and it sounds, it, it sounds banal, but it's not. I mean, that's, that's really the, the starting point for all of this, the civility and... Yeah. I like to um, make the connection between taking care of ourselves and being able to deal uh, well with others and be more... We're more civil and more kind and more forgiving when we're uh, taking care of ourselves better. So you work pretty long hours. And I think you uh, came like I did in the time of science, you know, where nobody even talked about mental health or well-being or resilience. And we probably still don't talk about it enough. I wonder what you do to take care of yourself. You have a remarkably stressful job. I know just the problems I send you alone and, and you get them from all over. So well, what do you do to take care of yourself? Yeah, I, um, you know, again, I mean, the overarching principle is I think what I do contributes to making it better for others. And so it does allow me to navigate a lot of the stresses and strains. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty, um, so, I, so I, it's going to sound trivial. So I walk to work every day, okay? And I, and I walk home every day. And, you know, it's it's only a 20-minute walk. Um, so my physician wishes it was longer. <laughs> but but that it, but it allows me to decompress um, coming in and, and going home. And then, and then I do, you know, we do, we do get on a, you know, during the, you know, the weather when it's nice, you know, get on a bike for a few hours, you know, each, each day on the weekend. Um, when I was much, much younger, I, I, I officiated basketball and that was a great stress reliever. But when, when people kept asking me which grandchild was mine, when I walked on onto the court, I decided it was time to, to stop that activity. Yeah. But uh, but so the physical activity is very very important for me, and uh, and and I do and I do try every day you know rain or shine to to get that that walk in. Yeah, thank you. Um, Lily Shu asked if you have one piece of advice for high school students, what it would be. I know you probably uh, don't remember that, you know, so many things from high school, but clearly in your story, some things stick out. So what would you tell Karen high school students? You, you, you cannot let anybody tell you what you can't do. You, if, if, if you have a goal, you have got to stick to it. And if you can't, if you can't reach your goal, going from point A to point B, then go from point A to point C, and then to point E, and then back around again to point B. That's certainly what I did. Um, I had, I had, I had, you know, somebody who said I'd never graduate from high school. And, you know, and it, it, I mean, it turned out okay, but, but had I let that person, you know, if had I believed what that person said about me, 
you know, obviously I would to wound up doing what I wound up doing. Yeah. So you got to believe in your ability and, and don't, don't let anybody now find out how to improve yourself, find out how to, you know, enhance, you know, enhance your knowledge and, and your abilities, but, but don't let anybody tear you down into thinking that you can't achieve something if you really want to. Mm -hmm. And that uh, there's a couple of other questions, one from Mylai Thompson and one from Nikhil Ramavinkat, uh, focused on regrets and resilience and maybe just putting those questions together. So surely, I mean, you've talked already about some setbacks, surely in life there are some regrets. And a part of your response is clearly about telling yourself a story of, of being able to persist and do something, but are do you have any secrets you would well, suggest? I'll, I'll share some regrets. And the reason, and, I, and, and it's, it's sort of uppermost in my mind at the moment. So two Saturdays ago, my, my grandson was bar mitzvah. Oh, mazel tov. Thank you. And uh, this is, for those of you who are not aware of it, this is sort of a coming of age uh, confirmation process when a, when a, a, a young Jewish boy or girl reaches the age of 12 or 13 and is is called up to to read from the holy books and so forth it's a rite of passage and and i and i was very 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 proud of of my grandson and his ability to 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 do what he he, he needed to do but i know that he was able to do it only because my son spent like an hour a day working with him over the past year and a half. My, my son, and, and I have two, both of them, are much better fathers than I was. Hmm. And, and so it, it's a regret that I was not a better father to them because I see how wonderful a father they have been and are being to their kids. I, 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 I am sad to say me as a you know 20 30 40 year old would not have spent an hour a day as my son did with his son yeah uh, and i and i never really thought about it until i saw my grandson up there you know really you, you know and, and this will not mean anything to most of you reading directly from the torah now it's a huge accomplishment it's a big deal you know and yeah. and so you know, so, so wonder, that, that's a big regret. I wonder if some of that is that message that science delivers of scientists work all the time and everything else comes second. And yeah, there's a little bit of a, a no, remote. listen, you know, it's true. And, 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 and if, and if I would turn to my other son, who was equally a wonderful, wonderful dad to his two children, yeah. when he got married and, and you're, and you're, you know, he asked me to give a little speech, you know, and he's married, I guess, about 10 or 11 years now. And we got to the part where, you know, here's, here's, you know, my, my, my recommendations for you. And I said, now remember, do as I say, not as I did, you need to spend more time. And he just broke out laughing because that was, yeah, you know, that was really uh, so yeah, so that, so that's a deep regret. And so what I tell all the kids in the lab, and, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't call them kids, but you know, when you're younger than my own children, you're, you know, you're, um, you know, when I tell, when I tell all the folks in the lab is you, you gotta get the right balance, which I failed to do. Yeah. Know, which I failed. To do. That's a really important message. I'm going to take you back to dentistry for a minute because oh. Amy says, who clearly may be thinking to be a dentist or is a dentist, wants to know whether uh, you think oral health will be embraced as a component of overall health uh, by the population. You know, it is true that, uh, right, we, we um, mostly people just don't like the dentist and we don't talk a whole lot yeah. about oral health. And yeah, you know, it, it, it's because of, our healthcare system. Actually, dentistry as it's performed today is spectacular. It is painless. It is efficient. Um, and, and dentists are able to deliver amazing service 
I'm going to my dentist Monday morning, okay? Um, but because the healthcare system is not set up to make dentistry as a part of it, and the, the cost of dentistry is still largely out of pocket. There are very few people who have insurance, insurance to cover yeah. their dental costs. It sort of takes the back seat. It's sort of, you know, you go when you have discretionary funds or more typically you go when you're in trouble. And, and, and so that's why dentistry gets a bad, you know, get, gets, gets a, a, you know, a bad rating, if you will. But, but dentistry has a tremendous amount to offer. And, um, and you know, I mean, so in my entire career, I only found one oral cancer. But one's pretty important to that one person. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I didn't practice very long. So, you know, there, there are some things that you do as a dentist that are life-saving. I mean, they go well beyond, you know, whether your teeth are bright and shiny and all this sort of stuff. But I, I, I think, no, I think, I think dentistry has got a lot to offer. My hope for the future is that we better align dentistry with the rest of, of, of medical care. Or to integrate That's it. That's what I for the future. The same for mental health, right? Indeed. We really need Indeed. this sort of holistic view of, of uh, our health. We're running out of time, so I'm going to give you the last word. I think we didn't get to all the questions, but some of our discussion touched on many of them. So you get to talk about whatever you would like to talk oh, about in the last I, two or three minutes. You know, I'm, I mean, look, I, you know, depending on where you are in your, your career path, you know, you, you have chosen, or at least you are contemplating, you know, going into what I feel is the most amazing, you know, professional opportunity there is, and that is, you know, science at some level, you know, what, however it is that you, you want to approach it. And I guess if you needed any evidence, you know, that you can make it, just point to me, because if I could make it, you could all make it, okay? Um, Persistence wins out over brilliance. Um, I, I tell people, trainees, all the time, that you, you do not have to be the smartest person in the room to succeed. You just always have to make sure you're in a room with smart people. Mm -hmm. And by participating in these programs, you're doing that. And you will learn from each other. You will, you will support each other. You will build a network that can last your entire life, um, and 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 if and whenever you are self doubting, just look at yourself in the mirror and say, "I want to reach my goal and figure out how to get there," and and you may have to modify your goal ever so slightly, but 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 you, you know don't let anybody else tell you what you can or cannot do. Thank you so much. That's a really perfect way to end. Um, trainees uh, here at NIH or those of you watching from other places will meet actually just in a little while at 345 for our June uh, community event. We're going to do some improv. So hope to see some of you there. Larry, thank you very, very much. So many um, trainees wish to have a chance to meet you, and this is a great way to have you meet a large number at one time. Thank you very, very much. My great pleasure. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye.